I'm going to do um, uh, just a quick quick round of, of introductions here. Um, hopefully, many of these you'll uh, you'll these folks are going to recognize. Um, uh, next to me is D. Gardetti, who ran uh, HR at General Magic, and Amy Lindberg, um, hardware engineer and software engineer at General Magic, and Sarah, one of the filmmakers, and of course, Mike, who we saw quite a bit, Mike Stern, uh, legal counsel, and finally, Matt, one of the filmmakers. So, thank you all for being here. It's, so, it's just so cool. Like celebrities, right? Like we're all, we're, we're in the presence of celebrities. Um, the, you know, kind of the first question I had is like, you know, you always wonder, like, where did all this footage come from? Like, like, what's going on with the cameras? Um, how did this happen? Who decided to do that? I was part of an original crew that was hired to film a General Magic because these ideas were so new and novel, and no one had ever seen a handheld communicator before. What the hell was that? So we were hired to come in, and we filmed for weeks on end with these incredible teams. And so that was the genesis of the footage. But there were also people shooting other more sort of home movie footage at the time and then of course we went back 20 years later to shoot the interviews and some footage of what was happening today but it was Mark's vision really he was incredibly um, he was obviously a very gifted communicator as I, I'm sure you saw but he also understood the medium of television he did that very early TV series on PBS called the information age and he was um, acutely aware of the power of it of of visual media so that's why he called, had us in originally and why we have that incredible footage you know I always wonder why with so much invention happening here in the valley everybody doesn't have their own filmmaking team because so much of that history is lost and not recorded so that's the that's the origin story um, and I, uh, I found it just fascinating as a filmmaker seeing all this incredible archival footage uh, knowing that each and every single person that you see in their sort of 20s and early 30s are the people that would go on to create all the technology products that we use today. And um, everybody just seemed so ordinary, like ordinary in their enthusiasm, in their passion, in their sort of egoless um, search for creativity. Uh, and that was just really striking to me of just kind of thinking that really it's, um, it's ordinary people when they do something extra that creates uh, extraordinary things. Uh, and I just thought that was a, a, a really powerful and important thing that, that needs to be told. And, it, and it's so told within that archival footage. So, uh, Amy, I, I got to wonder, it's just like a team full of dudes. Like, what, <laughs> what was that all about? Like, what was it like? Well, actually, um, it's odd, but for the time, but there were a huge number of women there. Um, and you must have seen in the footage, um, there were a lot of female engineers at General Magic. In fact, I, I don't think I've ever worked in a place that had so many women engineers. Um, it was a real ano anomaly. And um, I, the only thing I can attribute it to is that everyone was, like, so smart. They didn't really think about gender. It's so weird. They just were like, can you do this? And... You're on the team. Do you have anybody else have anything to add on that? I was just going to say about for, from Dee's perspective of, of hiring and, and where, where that came from in terms of hiring Dee. Well, it was really easy because everybody wanted to work at General Magic. So, um, And a lot of the people that we hired were people that were recommended from somebody else that was already working there. So, um, you know, it's just a great team of people that were brought together by all of us. And it was, um, you know, just amazing. And, and there was no, oh, she's, uh, you know, she's a female, so we can't hire her, or we should hire her because she is a female, or anything like that. There was, just, we just never thought of it that way, ever. Sticking with you for a minute, the uh, somebody keeps bugging me, sending me emails, saying hire me, hire me, hire mm -hmm. me. <laughs> what point does uh, irritating and amazing, um, where, where's, the, where's the line? Uh, uh, well, with Tony, you just could not ignore him. <laughs> no, you just couldn't. I mean, it was, it was impossible. I mean, honest to God, he called me probably 20 times a day for several weeks. And um, so maybe that was it. I was just so, so tired of it, you know. And, and he was such a good guy anyway on the phone. Um, but, you know, I mean, it is. It's being persistent. It's the people that get paid attention to. And, you know, anybody that's really, you know, paying attention and listening to a person that has that much passion in them would be missing an opportunity not by not bringing that person in for an interview. Yeah, yeah. Mike, we have a fair amount of um, law students here today. I'm, I'm curious, like, what, you know, how, how do you look at the role of, uh, 
of lawyers and legal counsel in, in a company, you know, kind of the, of the size and type of, of General Magic? We were lucky. We never got sued by anybody. But... Um, by anyone. Um, we set the record for all Silicon Valley public offerings with how many risk factors we had on the prospectus. We had over 20 single space pages of risk factors. For those of you who are in the law school, you know what that means. Um, so even though the stock tanked and all that, nothing happened. Um, we did um, spend two years fighting with the Justice Department over antitrust issues. We had 16 of the world's largest companies, all of whom competed with each other, together in the same room. How could they not be fixing prices and dividing markets? So before we could go public, we had to get rid of that one. And again, um, I have, was lucky and had great antitrust lawyers, and uh, we won that argument. Uh, so that was our biggest legal hassle. All right, very good. Um, I want to take a take a pause. Um, we can't see anyone, but Veronica, is there any any questions from um, from the audience? Quick question: How was it like keeping up the morale for when the share was tanking? Like, how was that like? Like making sure everybody was doing well, like keeping the motivation up. Well, um, we mostly didn't. <laughs> um, you know, the, the year after we went public, shipped the devices and nothing happened. Um, it, it, it was a year of clinical depression for many of us. Um, and it, it took me a year after I left the company before I felt competent or capable to do anything. You know, I went back to my law firm. Um, but I, I think m many of us uh, in the, on the management team were unable to keep our spirits up. Um, the kids, on the other hand, were able to do that and go on. Yeah, so I wasn't part of the management team. In fact, when I first saw this movie, I was like, oh my God! I had, <laughs> I had no idea this stuff was going on, right? I just was, it was like a, you know, it was like a, I don't know, it was, it was scandalous to me. And, um, because I was in the trenches. I was a hardware engineer in the trenches building the stuff. But for a lot of us, I mean, we knew that we were doing something really important and it was every day was super fun even even when the stock tanked whatever we were like ah whatever i think that we we kind of had the feeling at the time that there was uh, more runway and that um you know that that eventually it, it would just you know it would just work i think we, we we probably weren't on the management team so we really know the real numbers of what was happening so but morale was was really kind of pretty high in the trenches uh, for, for, for quite a while. Are there other questions, um, Veronica? Hi. Oh my god, I'm so starstruck. I didn't think I'd be starstruck for people that I didn't know about before today, but <laughs> hi. <laughs> so I'm currently a computer science major. I'm a freshman at Santa Clara, and I'm a hesitant comp sci major because I really want to do something with ethics and technology, but that's all I really know I want to do because I don't really it, it hasn't happened yet, you know, like I'm seeing it happen and I'm like, oh, this is so cool. I wish I could have like a job that hasn't happened yet. And I feel like that was kind of what happened with General Magic. So how did you guys deal with not knowing what was going to happen in the future and wanting to be able a part, you know, to be a part of that not knowing? We didn't really think that far ahead. We were so much in the moment and everybody was all marching in the same direction. That's what made it such an incredible t team to be with and work with. Um, and and I think a lot of the people at General Magic, they didn't you know, really know, they came in, my job was like that. I came in not having a clue what I was going to be doing. Um, and you know, you just develop along the way and you make, you. It was wonderful because we were able to make the job that we wanted to have within the company because there were no job descriptions. There was no, like, we need, and except for the engineers where we needed specific qualities and, and um, background. But even some of you guys didn't even know, you know, you came in, you're all so young, you know, the, and out of college that it was, you know, it was like Tony, he was a perfect example, you know, of, of coming in and not really knowing exactly where he fit, but just with his passion. And that's how all, everybody was there. And so for those of you that are starting your careers, I would say just continue to follow your dream. Uh, and, and my addition to that is kind of the soppy, uh, vomit-inducing one, which is that um, uh, it, it doesn't really matter what you do if you do it with people that you love working with. 
um, if you go to work every single day with people that inspire you, that people that challenge you, um, you'll find your way. Um, and I, I think about that a lot with filmmaking. That I, I'm always telling people, just come work in film because we're just filled with people that are practical and creative and empathetic. And that I think is is so important. So yeah, just make sure that you're working with people that that you really love working with, and the stuff that you make is almost kind of secondary to it. There's this whole Steve Jobs quote, which is that um, the journey is the reward not the destination and I think about that all the time so today in the Silicon Valley we see very big tech companies that have a very hierarchical structure and there are startups which have they're just a few people so there's little management so let's say I was to start a startup today which would you focus on like creating a management structure or would you prefer to lay everything like evenly uh, just so all employees have like even input sort of do them both yeah. working in a startup is a special experience the problem is they're insatiable they will take everything you've got and leave you with nothing um, that can be a real problem the no notion of work-life balance doesn't exist working at a place like HP you know you can go home at six um, and you learn management skills and all and the rest of that um, you get taught in a different way yeah, I, I, uh, I totally agree. I think it's the uh, genius of the and. Um, you need uh, chaos, and but it needs to be organized, right? Payroll's got to happen. Um, I have a picture in my office I've been packing around for at least two decades that is a tortoise with a rocket strapped to its back. And uh, you can go slow and methodical, but fast as hell. And, um, and I think that's how you have to look at it. Either extreme, um, it's not much fun um, after a while. And I think um, uh, n not the best path to success. So kind of always focusing on how do you get, how do you get both, uh, you know, some of both of those. Incredible film and incredible story as well. Uh, Great question. My, <laughs> Next. my question uh, is actually regarding the product itself. Uh, in terms of the team, at that time, the product was like something futuristic. It, there was no technology, there was no internet. But how did the team, some of the brightest folks in tech, d believe in something so far ahead? And how did uh, the initial concept even come to them and decide that there can be a company around it. Um, I think it was really, uh, Mark. Mark's vision was, I mean, you saw the, the, the footage in the film. It was just unbelievable. You, you, he said something and you saw it. We all believed it. But also beyond that, when I joined, um, I guess I joined in 92, there were so many formidable engineers there that were doing incredible things. And so you had the vision, then you had people working on stuff, and you just couldn't believe what they were doing. So the two things together. But I think that the thing we learned was, once again, you, you, we couldn't do it all. Now, now things are much more iterative. T Tony told that story very well. Uh, now, um, it, you know, it, it's quite a different game now. But we, we just, we just didn't know any better, you know. And so, and we, and we all paid for it. <laughs> so we all paid for it later. But we all learned from it. So, um, anyway, my question is: Y'all had a lot of competitors in the same room. How did y'all get them on board and how did y'all get them to work with each other? In some ways the sales process was too easy. It was like shooting fish in a barrel. Um, you know when you have your lawyer run a sales process it's too easy and you know I did most of it um, because um, all of these companies were afraid of the future. They didn't know what was going to come next. Um, they hadn't had a hit in consumer electronics for nearly uh, almost a decade. Uh, they needed someone to show them the way. They chased us. So that was the, the sales part was, like Dee said about hiring, I mean, you know, people literally chased us down the subway platform in Tokyo, the, the, vice, the senior vice president of Mitsubishi begging Mark to say he would let him into the next round. Um, getting them to work together though, was much more complicated and much more difficult. The telecoms were better at it because they already knew how to exchange phone calls across national borders. So France Telecom, NTT, and AT&T did cooperate to build a worldwide telescript-based network. The device guys hated each other. Panasonic and Sony hated each other. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, and Motorola uh, didn't work with either of the other two, in, in my memory, Amy, if that's correct. So that was a lot tougher, and, in some way, and it was one of the reasons why we failed, I think. I guess I would say, too, uh, uh, an odd thing 
back then, I, it's just so different now because um, in, a real, in a weird way, there, there wasn't that much going on. <laughs> You know, I mean, now it's just nuts, and so there's so much competition. Like, can you imagine people chasing you like down the subway for anything now? It's like, you know, it's so it was a little bit like shooting fish in a barrel. Not to diminish our, our, you know, how brilliant we were and all that stuff like that, but at least there was not that much going on. It was the freaking early '90s, right? So, but you guys are so much smarter now. You're so lucky. Everything's so much easier. So much less room for failure, but more competition, I think. More competition. You know, we feel like everything's been invented, but that's not true. Everything gets reinvented, so. That actually perfectly uh, ties into my question. My question is, we all have smartphones now, right? So what's the next big thing? I believe it's personal robotics, but how does a startup compete with somebody like Tesla on, on, a, on a task like that? So for me, I think the future is AI embedded. I'm working in AI and cancer detection, so it will transform healthcare, it will transform every aspect of our life. So for sure that's the next big thing, but what's the really next big thing? I'm going to hand over to Amy. You know, this is a little bit of a contrarian view because um, I everything keeps getting reinvented, as I mentioned a minute ago, and I, I remember in 2007 um, I was looking out at the world and I, you know, was I hadn't been working for a long time and, and I, I just was, because I was raising my kids and I was, I was, I was, I was like, ugh, you know, photos have been done, like, you know, like there was like Shutterfly and this and that. I was like, that's done, that's completely done. And then, I, you know, six months later, like, you know, like Instagram shows up, you know, just like a you know, billion dollar company in like, you know, four weeks, you know. I mean, so I mean, I. It's always this twist of new technology coming along and old technology, you know, older technology and just making it more useful and twisting it and turning it. I think that there's always a new opportunity out there. It's about creativity. And that's why, that's why today it's such a fantastic time to, to be an entrepreneur because it requires creativity. It requires creativity. It requires skills. It requires language, uh, language skills. Um, back when we were doing it in those days, um, you could get away with, you know, lots of technology and a little bit of creativity now it requires a lot of creativity i believe to be successful and so technology is important but almost not the important most important thing i think we did a, a screening and a talk at google and uh one of the team members there said i look at the spirit of general magic in the archival footage and i remember that's what i used to feel like when i worked at google he'd been there from the kind of early days and he asked the question how, how do we recreate that how do we bring that kind of sense of magic back into our work and back into our teams because he was saying I, I feel like we, we need to we need to bring some of that back and the only answer i could kind of come up with was to say that when you work on something that will change people's lives to a certain extent to the extent excuse me where it is a need, not a want. And those are two very different things. Someone goes into a store and they want something is very different to going into a store and needing something. If you can create products, if you can create services that change people's lives so that everybody is affected by it, that work is so important, particularly now in where we live politically and how we work in climate, in inequalities. Um, so I, I'm, I'm always encouraging people to, to think about that kind of work, the work that isn't just based on consumerism, but is more about changing the lives of your grandparents, changing the lives of your grandkids. Um, that, that, that's the, the thing that's really meaningful. And that's, I think, the stuff that really inspires teams. When we look at kind of back at General Magic, this idea that you could create a product that connects anybody anywhere across the world at any time. We are all living addict, addicts of that. We're all addicted to it because it enables us to be connected to whoever we want at any time, to an information at any time, to a connectivity whenever we want it. And so, yeah, I, I think about it through that lens. So if you're working in robotics, how is it that that affects everybody in such a way that it, it becomes, I, I need to have that because it makes my parents' lives better. It, it will make everybody's lives better. So I always think it through that, that sort of lens. I, I, can, I can add a little bit. Um, I uh, uh, worked with someone you know, quite some time ago that shared this perspective with me that when it comes to technology, we tend to way overestimate how much change we can affect in five years, but we tend to way underestimate how much change we could affect in 10 years. So, so my, my advice is always play the long game, really look at these, you know, uh, uh, truly audacious goals. I, I think General Magic showed, you know, it, it, you know, exemplified that in many ways of like, what happens if you just try to change everything and rethink it completely? Um, it, it's amazing how much progress you can make if you just give yourself some runway. 
I think that's it for okay. audience questions. So okay, um, I, I'd love to hear just a little pass through. Like, what's next? What do we do with this wonderful lesson from General Magic and this film and and you know this this you know this wonderful team we have here and uh, uh, these lessons? Like, where, where does it go from here? I want people to share their dreams and their ambitions and to be openly bold and um, to remember that the, at the end of the day, it's all about pers pers perseverance. I was gonna say perseverance, perseverance. So just keep going. Your ideas are really, really important, no matter how old you are or where you live. You, if you bring your creativity and your heart and your passions and you follow those clues, those breadcrumbs, you will do amazing things. So that is what I hope of general, the general magic community of which you are now a part. I mean, I, I call this movie a real feel-good movie because you just can't go any lower, you know what I mean? So. <laughs> I would say, what's next? If you have anything on your mind, don't think anything is stupid or that you don't want to share it with people. Um, just dream big, you know? Just nothing is... Um, th there's no wrong answer to, to what you're going to try. You know, just try it. If it fails, it fails. Move on to the next thing. Um, and always surround yourself with people that you love working with because it is makes the world of difference that for me at General Magic it was truly all about the people and it still is uh, I'm just adding on to what Dee says is that you know we there is so many problems in the world and uh, they're not getting solved fast enough uh, the hope in making this film is it inspires people uh, having watched it to think I might something I tried in the past didn't work out but this is this whole film is about people that failed picked themselves up and then achieved global success like life changing success and that that's for all of us to do and we all have a responsibility to do that so the hope is as he says to, to dream big but to have more confidence in yourself too and and then to speak exactly because d just stole my line is just just work with people that you love working with and even if they're people that you disagree with all the time if you love working with them those are the people you should be working with you should be disagreeing all the time on the things you're working on because that's what makes it better it's, it's up to your generation to do something about authoritarianism climate change and the ethics of technology as one of our earlier questioners talked about um, the ethical problems posed by everything from genetic engineering to AI are stunning but the solutions lie in your hearts and in your minds and we look to you it's your planet now save it thank you um, it's been my distinct pleasure um, to, meet, to meet all of you and, and to be part of this evening. So th thank you all. And I, I know, uh, I know from, from many years ago, being on the other side of, of these lights, um, how important moments like these are and how life changing. And we often never even find out like who's, how, 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 what people did with what they learned and what they experienced tonight. So thank you all for, for being part of it. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, guys.